I am Harish Talani. I am a content creator and this is some of what I do. Today's video is about casual racism. I consider myself quite woke. But the recent discussions about race have made me wonder if I know enough about my fellow Singaporeans. Can we go beyond CMIO? So the best way to find out? Over food. I am going on a gastronomic journey with Singaporeans to their favourite food haunts. The noodles are, are bomb, man. Legit. Where we talk about a heavy topic over a light meal. The one thing that the Koreans love to pamper you with, it's the abundance of side dishes. On paper, I'm an Arab or others. We have a Chinese teacher who said to me, Shui Ling, you're a Korean, but you don't speak Korean. There's no such thing as an Indian and a Malay. It's just a Singaporean. And in this episode, I'm meeting with the group we call Malays. Right now, I'm going to meet someone I've known for seven years. And like me, she also started out on YouTube. And she's somewhere here! I was trying to hide from you. Hello! Yeah, it's a very difficult place to hide. I like my Arab hair with Arab girls exposed. I make my values and my models free from yours. Muna started off creating parody videos on YouTube. I have that and attraction also. They were comedic skits with a friend and partner in crime, Hirzi Zulkifli. At the height of their popularity, they had 48 million views on their channel. Welcome, this is Studio Tampanese, where the magic of Muna Hirzi used to happen. Wow, the yep. set is so real, it really looks like a HDB yeah, project. Know, you see the fixtures, the lights, props, everything yeah. still intact. I think a lot of the content that we put out was from our own experiences, mm. you know. So it was pretty much just familiar places that we grew up in. That's why you see like characters who are like a vast range of different types of Singaporeans. So coming back here, how does it feel? Eh? I still stay here. Uh -huh. uh, it's still very familiar. And there are times where I walk by, I'm like, oh my god, yeah, here's it. Oh, I used to it. like shoot like crazy things around here. For lunch, Muna is taking me to a hawker centre nearby for a dish called Nasi Rawon. It's a traditional Indonesian dish. Rawon is the signature dark coloured soup, made from buah keluak. Okay, Haresh, so this is the stall that I found that is the closest to how my aunt used to make Nasi Rawon. I feel like you should go for the sambal sotong one. Okay, can. Okay. Untuk dia sambal sotong, and then untuk me just the classic nasi rawan. This food brings back memories of yeah, for you your childhood. For sure, because like my aunt used to be the one cooking at our home. Nasi rawan was my favorite. Like she knew if I have been a good little baby, uh -huh. she'd be like, okay, I'm cooking nasi rawan. So today, it's like, like a reward. We've been good. That's why we get. We've this, been good. It? We've been good, so we we're get good. nasi rawan. Yay! Ah, okay. Jumpa lagi. Terima kasih. Okay, thank Jumpa you, lagi. Thank you. When you order nasi rawan, it comes with this set. You've got paru, and then you've got bagadil. And how my aunt used to make it, she would put like minced beef in it, so it's like full. And then sambal goreng, serunding, which is coconut flakes. Coconut flakes. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, it's damn good. There are a lot of other Malay dishes that I really love, but I think something about this is just, it, I don't know, it makes sense. Mm. It's like different people coming together on a plate and then it makes sense. Just like Singapore. Exactly! Yeah, that was what I was getting at. Yeah. <laughs> we have become such a mix of things, right? So, on paper, I guess I'm an Arab or others. Oh, you're others? <laughs> yeah! Oh. <laughs> Both my granddads were Arab. Mm. And of course, here, you kind of follow your dad's race, right? One grandma, she was Chinese, and then my other grandma was Malay. And like, I think she's got a heavy influence on how we grew up as well. I never met her. I was actually named after her. So like her name was Maimuna, and she passed away the year before I was born. Growing up, did it ever get confusing for you? The funny thing is, the only moment I realised that like, oh, okay, there are all these labels is in school. Yeah. 
when we had to tick the boxes, they said race, and I was like, what do I tick? I had to ask my teacher like, hey, then what, what am I your, ticking? What did your teacher say? And he was like, oh, you, you are others. I said like, I'm others, what? And he was like, yeah, because you're Arab. I'm like, I'm Arab, what? So I went back, I'm like, we're Arab, what? <laughs> <laughs> so when people ask you now, okay, what is your race? race? My race. Honestly, like, I think, in this day and age that you cannot sit a Singaporean down anymore and ask like, what's your race? You know what I mean? Because everyone's always like a mix of something. I think that there's more to a person than just what it says in the tick box. Do you watch your own videos? <laughs> yes, why? <laughs> Where is this going? Because I mean, going back to when it all started, you know, the, the magic of your content. What is happening? Are we watching our own? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're... <laughs> I don't even remember what this video is about. action. No! Who are these crazy kids? You know sometimes when I watch like old videos of us like as kids like this, right? I understand when people who are much older watch it and they go like, these crazy kids. <laughs> and that was the time when YouTube was still very new. Like. It was like non -existent, One of the OGs. Like, like. Right. Now there's a lot more calls for diversity and all that. But as you were in this industry, did it impact you in any way? There are times where I know like I'm taken on because like you're the token minority in this CMIO picture. I choose to see the positive side of things and see it as a step into it. To me, it's progress if, even on screen, yeah. even the visual of seeing a diverse cast can be very powerful. Nice. Like, yeah, yeah. So actually, yeah. like there has been like a few dramas where when I go for the audition, I know that they want to cast a Chinese person, but then like when I audition, they, okay, we'll change it to a Malay character for the actor. So there's that I see, openness I see. Yeah, where yeah, yeah. people look at the actor more than, okay, I want a Chinese role. I see. So, so I guess it's, I, a, it's, a, it's a fine line. Like, yeah, a, this but, is so stressful. I don't think like we are where we need to be yet, but yeah. I feel like we are moving somewhere. Yeah. And we need to celebrate the little win. I started creating content because I saw a lack of stories about issues like race told from the perspective of a minority. So chatting with Muna really reminded me of my own journey and just like her, I can see positive changes in the industry for the better. Next, I meet the first Michelin-starred Malay chef. As I get older, right, I feel more like I should showcase the cuisine that I grew up with, like what you're having right now. Chef I'm at restaurant Alma, headed by Chef Heiko. It has just been awarded a Michelin star for the fifth year running. Is there a particular award that means the most to you? The 2017 Michelin star. We thought we lost it. I was so like demoralized. Yeah. And the best twist is they sent the letter to the hotel. Oh. And, the, and the hotel thought that it's like some like Michelin tire thing, you know? Oh. Yeah, so they don't open it. Oh, that was such a relief. Oh, so, good. 2017 will be my mind forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I have so many questions. I know we're going to talk a lot over a meal. Right. And where is the meal going to be? It's one of my favorite places, mm -hmm. right? Where, you know, I grew up with actually. It's a Nasi Padang place. Mm -hmm. It's in Gelang Sarai. Chef Heiko was involved in a motorcycle accident in Thailand six years ago. It initially left him paralyzed, but he has since recovered enough to stand and walk short distances. Hi, hello. hello. You are having rice here? Yes. For me, I will have the chicken kaleo. Okay. What the else? sambal goreng. Yeah. And of course, the tapioca leaf. Sure. And I will just have the same. <laughs> if it's your recommendation, I trust it. <laughs> Nasi Padang translates to rice from Padang City, 
the capital of West Sumatra. It is often served with a selection of pre-cooked dishes, such as rendang. So this is like your comfort food place? Lah. My granddad is from uh, Padang. Uh. He's from uh, Minangkabau, right? Yeah. This is where Nasi Padang come from. Uh -huh. The man goes out to work, right? Mm. So at that time, they went out to all over other parts of the country. Yeah. And then they bring their influence lah, from food to like maybe to Singapore. Yeah. So my granddad was one of those people. Lah. I see. Yeah, yeah. So he brings back a lot of memories. Lah. There's one time when I was in the ICU, right? Yeah. They put a tube onto my mouth. I couldn't eat solid food. The whole time I was thinking of like nasi padang. Really? So after three months, the therapist came and said that, okay, we'll try tonight to see whether if you eat right, will the food go into your stomach or to your lungs? I told my mom, you know, I want to eat nasi padang. Ah. The best part is after I eat, right, the next day, I fall sick, sir. Really? Yeah. yeah. Fall sick and then go to ICU back again. <laughs> I think eat too fast and yeah. overeat. <laughs> so, did you ever try to learn how to make these dishes? Funny thing is, when I was growing up as a young cook, I loved to eat all these dishes, you know, but my thought at that time was learning how to cook uh, French cooking, you know, mm. all these atas cooking, uh -huh. right? But now, after doing almost 26 years in this industry. Suddenly, I became more interested in this uh, so-called my heritage, uh, uh -huh. all these dishes. I guess as I get older, right, I don't know, maybe I feel more, I feel more Malay. I feel more mm. like, you know, I should showcase the cuisine that I grew up with. I might be the first Malay Michelin star chef in the world. Yeah. I don't say it's my responsibility, but I want to showcase what is Malay cuisine. Do you feel added pressure now to blaze the trail uh, for other people from the Malay community? Actually, I feel happy. I don't think it's pressure for me. Uh, because I know that whatever I'm doing every day, right? I'm doing it solely because of my own passion and pursuit to create a good dining scene wherever I am. I see. So even for your family, you grew up in a... in what, like your 100% Malay or...? My whole family, right? We are like UNESCO. La. My brother-in-law is Sri Lankan. Uh -huh. My another cousin is Chinese. And then we have a Swedish cousin also who married my cousin. My grandmother, my mom's side, is, uh, she's, she's born Chinese, but adopted by a Malay family. My wife is Chinese. Like racial harmony. Yeah, racial yeah. harmony, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when you got married, what was that process like? Back then, it was not easy. For my part, I think most of the time it's about religion differences. Yeah. And then a family might worry, you know. For example, like, oh, you mean you cannot eat pork anymore? So, small little things, but I think it's up to individual. Take away my race and my religion mm. as a person. Am I good enough for their daughter or not? So, do you have children now? I have two now. Do you feel the need to explain to them the nature of your interracial marriage? Sometimes people will ask them, what are you? Then I will explain to them, like, you know, you can be a Chinese, you can be a Malay, it doesn't matter. You know? People don't judge you for what you are, depending on your race or religion. Yeah. These days, it's so easy to get angry over racial issues, be it personally, online, or even as a society. Which is why it's so encouraging to speak to someone like Chef Haikal, who seems to have found a great balance in his own interracial marriage, despite initial apprehension from their families, as well as the challenges of bringing up mixed-race children. He's overcome all of that, including his own life-threatening accident, which is why it's so inspiring to see him thrive. What would you say to people who maybe say, the reason why you got into that GRC is because of minority representation? A minister who enjoys K-pop songs and plays a Chinese instrument called a kutsung? That's my next lunch buddy, Dr. Maliki Osman. Hi, Dr. Maliki. Hi, Harris. How are you? Harris. Good to meet you. Dr. Maliki did end talk social work before joining politics in 2001. 
He is an MP in the East Coast GRC, but we have decided to meet here in Topayo instead. What is the significance of this place? Oh, this is really why I grew up. I grew up in this block 97. Oh. It used to be a rental flat. There were about three rows of rental flats here, and then there was the purchase flats here. So we always see that, oh, well, poor people live this side, the richer people to sit on this side. Lah. I used to play soccer here. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, there was a field here, and this is still a playground, yeah. but a very different playground. One thing that I always recall is this shop run by this man called Asing. Uh, it's a provision shop, and you know, all of us, we don't have much money all the time. So what Asing does is he always allows us to take things on credit. Oh, really? The good thing is that doors were hardly closed. So whether you are a Chinese family, a Malay family, we will just go in and out of the flats. Yeah. See, my family is quite big, and there were 11 of us. 11. Nine kids, right? In a one-room flat, 35 square meters. Every night, we will just take out our, uh, we call it tikka, la. it's a mat, straw yeah, mat, yeah, yeah. with our pillow, and we just go to the corner of that corridor and sleep there. In the corridor? At the corridor, because we just don't have space inside the house. There's so many things I want to ask you about that journey, but I would like to do it over a good meal. Is there a place that you would recommend? Why do we have some traditional Malay food? Okay. I'll take you to Haja Maimuna. Okay, great. Alright, we'll go there. Haja Mahmuna is one of the most famous nasi parang restaurants in Singapore and one of the few halal establishments listed in the Michelin Bib Gourmet. Dr. Maliki, what made you choose this place? Well, I come here for lunch quite regularly, yeah. especially with my wife. Hello. 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 Okay. So, typical of Padang food is really when you have a whole spread yeah. and you are spot for choice. Wow, yeah. there is so much food. <laughs> what I would recommend for us, we will have the ikan baka. Yeah. We have tahu telur. Okay. Then I would suggest we will have this sotong masa hitam, which is very good. <laughs> oh, the food here. Wow. wow. Terima kasih, ya. Thank you Ooh. so much. Okay, so that's our ikan baka. This is the tau telo, very mm -hmm. famous in Padang originating for Surabaya. Yeah, and that one is the sotong. This is the sotong masak hitam. This is sambal belacan. Ooh. So you see this sambal belacan? Yeah. I learned to cook from my mother and the first dish she taught me was the sambal belacan. She will teach me how to pound it. You pound it in the pestle and the mortar. Oh, I see. You call it lasong. Okay, okay. You just pom 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 until it gets very very fine. It also reflected the Malay's way of life at that time. Thank you. My mom makes a point to cook and she cooks a lot. She pampers us a lot. Breakfast, lunch, tea break. And all 11? All 11 of us. She will cook, yeah. So I impressed my wife by cooking. Oh, that's great. Uh, that's great. <laughs> that's a skill I have not picked up yet. <laughs> But did you all ever cook for your for your neighbours? Yes. I lived in a HDB flat before yeah. and now I live in a private uh, estate. Mm. My neighbours are mainly Chinese, okay. but we have very good relationship. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about my house is, you know, my house is not that big, lah, but I have a lot of guests. So I asked my neighbour, do you mind if I borrow your front porch to use it for my guests? They were like, oh yeah, sure, you're going to have a party, is it? But the interesting is that for Chinese New Year, they used my house. I offered my house to be used for them to have their friends and families over. So that spirit of neighbourliness is quite interesting where I live. So that brings me to the question of, you know, there's one thing about having neighbours yes. organically, but when yeah. the neighbour is almost decided for you... Yes. That relates to the, the ethnic integration policy yeah. that we have in the 80s. The government at that time was beginning to see that trend happening. The Chinese choose to live in a certain area, the Malays choose to live in a certain area, the Indians choose to live in a certain area. If we don't have EIP today, I worry that if we are not conscious, it may be a possibility that people will end up gravitating to where and who they are comfortable with. How do you think the CMIO model fits in this day and whether it's still relevant? We saw the census of population recently. It was shown that the number of Malay families in rental flats was increasing. 
And if we don't have CMIO, and we will not be able to track some of these developments, we won't be able to see how the Malay community, for example, is advancing forward with more uh, the younger ones being able to get to university. So right now you're an MP for East Coast Sigla. What would you say to people who maybe say the reason why you got into that GRC is because of minority representation? Do people vote according to ethnic lines? Some argue yes, some argue no. If you ask me, can't I be voted in on my own credential? Mm -hmm. On a personal level, I am confident, but I'm not quite sure whether my constituents will see it that way too at this point in time. To be honest with you, when I walk the ground, in my constituency, easily 50% are elderly Chinese. I have to speak Hokkien. I have to speak Mandarin because it's important for me to tell them I want to communicate with them. So we probably will have to see the extent to which our population is ready. I mean, the food is really good. I'm almost done with mine already. You, have, you barely touch you your know, right. When you reach a certain age, uh, mm. there's, there's limits to what you can take. <laughs> so, do you then feel as um, the voice of minorities just because of your role as a minority politician? The minority community expect that. Mm. So, for example, employment. At one time, remember, there was Mandarin speakers only need apply. We'll get to the employer, we we'll ask why did you require him to speak Mandarin if the requirement does. Then put justification as to why you need the person to be able to speak Mandarin. So we will not tolerate instances where there is blatant discrimination because of race. But what is one thing that gives you hope for the future when it comes to race issues? I see a very informed younger generation, passionate about causes, wanting to improve the society that we have today. Someone changed immediately. But walking the ground will tell you that it's not easy because every time you change something, there will be a group that is happy, there will be another group that will be totally against your decision. And how do you find that balance? And that's the biggest challenge. I personally have questioned the CMIO model, but from talking to Dr. Maliki, I can understand the marriage from his perspective. At the same time, I do think it needs to evolve. It shouldn't remain static. But as long as we are continuing to challenge, continuing to question, I think we are on the right path.